neurological surgeon in Bournemouth in 2007 and is a visiting professor at Bournemouth University. So Kevin is going to talk to us because he's got a lot of experience in this over the past few years looking at the issue of adverse effects affecting urologists and uh, issues around reliance. Kevin, you're very welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Kieran, for the introduction. Thank you to Baus for the opportunity to come and speak to you. Thank you to David Selu for an extraordinary presentation, and it is an honor to follow on from you, sir. Adverse events, urologists, and resilience. The premise of this talk is that when things go wrong in surgery, it has a profound impact upon us, and that is a problem that we need to do something about. It's not a new problem. René LaRiche was one of those frustratingly talented medical polymaths who said something of value about many things. But this is something that he said which was of great value, I think, that every surgeon carries within themselves a small cemetery where from time to time they must go to pray, a place of bitterness and regret, where they must look for an explanation for their failures. I do not know when René LaRiche wrote that, but I would guess it would be almost exactly 100 years ago when he would have been in the middle of his career. 30 years ago, the problem was still there. Richard Hayward, a neurosurgeon, Great Ormond Street. There is a time, usually but not always, on becoming a consultant when a surgeon must learn to come to terms with the inadequacies and sometimes downright failures of his or her actions that will be the inevitable comp companions during a surgical life. And it remains a contemporary problem. PTU is a transplant surgeon at Yale, writing last year, no other profession that demands elite performance has devoted so little to the well-being of its practitioners. Last year at Baus, um, I had the opportunity to share some of the background to the work we've been doing in Bournemouth, and we discussed that surgeons are profoundly affected when things go wrong. We discussed that most of the evidence for that comes from the United States that most of it um, mixes surgeons with other medical practitioners, and that nearly all of it conflates errors and complications, a distinction to which we may return. We discussed that there is almost no knowledge, no research knowledge, no data, about the impact that adverse events has on the surgeon and surgeons in the UK. We discussed that what we do in the immediate aftermath of an adverse event is frankly inadequate. At best, it's chaotic. At worst, it is destructive. We discussed that surgeons can be described as the second casualty of a serious adverse event, a term I prefer to second victim. We discussed that there are some unique things about surgeons and surgical practice. And of course, much of uh, what happens in the aftermath of an adverse event is common to all medical practitioners. But part of my thesis is that there are some surgeon-specific things because of what we do and perhaps because of the kind of people that we are. We discussed that existing support is often inadequate, that it rarely goes beyond support of colleagues and family, and that colleague support, whilst always well-meaning, is not always helpful. And we discussed that there is no knowledge within the surgical profession about whether resilience can be enhanced amongst surgeons. Can we indeed be prepared for those inevitable consequences of the surgical life? Now, those of you who think that I'm straying too much into psychobabble may be sitting there thinking that surgeons are the best of the best. We know what it's like to be up there. We know that sometimes you don't have time to think. You may also be thinking that we are the best of the best with a very particular set of skills honed over a long period of time. You might actually be thinking that surgeons are really quite tough. Now, the whole issue of the surgical personality is a debate which has occupied surgical coffee rooms forever and rumbles on in the published literature. Are surgeons different? Are we different because we've done surgery? Do different people go into surgery? Is that a genuine distinction or is it illusory? And does it matter anyway? And if we are different, in what ways are we different? And are all of those differences a bad thing or might some of them be a good thing? Shortly after Baus last year, Claire Garada published this paper in the Bulletin of the RCS. 
Claire Garada is a GP, former president of the Royal College of GPs, and she runs the only NHS-funded uh, service for, uh, only uniquely for doctors, uh, to look after doctors with mental health issues called PHP, the Physician Health Programme. Now, she discusses that 11% uh, of doctors in the UK who are registered with the GMC are surgeons, but only 4.3% of the people that use her service are surgeons. So we are underrepresented when we seek formal support. And she discusses why that might be. Might it be because tough people go into surgery, so when things go wrong, we don't break as easily? Might it be that ordinary people go into surgery, but the excellence of surgical training, the support that we have, and the experience of becoming a surgeon makes us tough? But she concludes that the truth is that we are no tougher, but that we see barriers to seeking support. And as a consequence, we are a minority within a minority when it comes to seeking support when things go wrong. So there is this ongoing dilemma about the surgical stereotype. Are we resilient, stress immune, with effective coping strategies, tough-minded, able to flex and bend the rules when that's appropriate? Or are we, in fact, second casualties, beaten and bruised by what we do, but um, poor at seeking help? And it's with this as a, as a background that in Bournemouth a few years ago, we began to think about whether we could look at this question um, in a way which was perhaps a little more research-based, which would generate genuine data. And as we've heard recurrently uh, over the last few days, it is only by data that we can effect change. So what does the research tell us? But can we most importantly go beyond just describing the problem, important as that may be, and actually do something about it? And so we identified sort of three areas that we really wanted to try and say something about. The first, we've done the most work on, and we wanted to find out what is the state of play in the UK at the moment among UK surgeons in terms of the impact of adverse events upon us? Does what happens, the type of event, really make a difference to the way that we feel? And does what we are like, either because of our traits or because of our psychological state, make a difference to how we're affected? Once we've described the problem, can we really train each other or can we be trained to cope better with those rigors of the surgical life? And accepting that there always will be adverse events and therefore always an aftermath, can we do better than what we currently do in terms of immediate support? So three main areas of work. A national survey, can we prepare and protect, and what can we do about first aid? And the national survey, when it comes down to it, really sought to uh, establish four things. What happened? What was the event? How severe was it? What were the consequences for the patient? What happened to you? Were you investigated? By whom? What was the outcome? Were you sanctioned and in what way? And then some validated questions about what are you like? What are your personality traits? And then some questions about how are you? What is your state? The National Survey has been open since 2016. It's still open. Um, it, I really hope that many of you have seen it. I know many of urologists have completed it. And at the end, I will encourage those of you who haven't to take part because more data is always more valuable. So this is the sorts of things we looked, out, looked at in the national survey. The uh, analysis of the data is at an early stage, and one of our PhD students is looking at this at the moment, and we've not previously presented any outcome data from the national survey. But if we look at the first 700 respondents, we see that surgeons see a clear distinction between an error and a complication, which to me seems kind of obvious, but to the literature up until this point has been completely blurred. And complications, as you might expect, are things that happen because we recognize that they happen, albeit sometimes rarely, whereas errors, surgeons tell us, that the predominant contributing factor was because they made a mistake. And that's true across the whole sample, and it's true when I look at the, or when we look at the 130 or so urologists who we've had a chance to assess so far. There are, of course, multiple other contributing factors to errors, some of these personal, some of these systems related, and we've heard already so eloquently this morning that it is systems that frequently let our patients down. And so they highlighted there in blue are the things which are, uh, are, are higher uh, for those certain conditions, and you'll see that there are multiple other contributing factors uh, when an error occurs. 
If we turn to how surgeons feel when something goes wrong, then when something goes wrong, surgeons feel really, really bad. And I can't overstate how deeply felt the negative feelings are after an adverse event. Uh, and of course, we feel worse when it's worse for the patient. We feel worse when we're investigated. And we are, of course, quite likely to change our practice. And sometimes not in a way which is helpful, because we may become risk adverse, or check obsessively, or order unnecessary tests when something goes wrong. And that's true across the whole sample. And it's uh, exactly the same for urologists. When we turn to current support, we find, and consistent with what Claire Garada told us, that fewer than half of us talk to anyone about the impact that an adverse event has had upon us. And when we do talk to someone, it is nearly always our colleagues and our family who will always be well-meaning, but often unprepared or unresourced, and that we are appalling at seeking formal support, and urologists perhaps worse than surgeons generally. If we turn then to some validated indices of well-being, burnout is a thing. It's not being mentally ill. It's about feeling exhausted. Uh, it's about having a sense of reduced accomplishment. It's about being physically and mentally spent. And it arises from long-term involvement in work situations that are emotionally uh, challenging, which, of course, is surgery. And we heard uh, from John Thornhill at Baus last year about the work he's done about the prevalence of burnout amongst urologists. And surgeons are burnt out, much more so than the general population or by other, than, uh, uh, and comparison to other professions. Interestingly, we are generally not mentally ill. And I think this is really important. This is not to identify people who have a mental illness. This is to uh, identify people who are suffering the predictable consequences of what we do. And fascinatingly, we display many of the traits that are part of a post-traumatic stress response. Now, do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we have a, a diagnosis of PTSD, which is a clinical diagnosis. But when we asked about the prevalence of characteristics that go into PTSD, like intrusive thoughts, like flashbacks, like dreams, like avoiding situations which bring an adverse event to mind, then we display those characteristics just as frequently as military personnel who have been in a conflict situation, and much more frequently than the general population. So what are surgeons like? We are severely affected by adverse events, whether complications or errors. That the, the impact of that adverse event upon us is profound. That we seek support, but not enough. And perhaps most importantly, that we are no tougher. Hard as it may be to believe, we are ordinary people doing an extraordinary job. And because we know how ordinary people respond to stress, surgeons respond just exactly like that. And because we respond like that, we are burnt out and we display features of PTSD. And that doesn't mean that we are mentally ill. So briefly now. Can we prepare? If this is what's going to happen, can we stop it happening? You know, when I was a trainee, people taught me lots of things about, uh, about how to operate. They even began to teach me things about communication skills. But no one ever said to me, when you are a consultant surgeon, some really, really bad things are going to happen to you. This is predictably how you're going to feel. And these are the ways that you can mitigate that response. And there is evidence for the efficacy of psychological interventions in other professions. There is evidence that resilience can be enhanced. But this has never been done in a surgical workforce. We know that resilience itself is not resilient. It can go up and down. It can be measured and it can be increased. But it's not been tried in surgeons before. And I'm really pleased to say that earlier this year, we got national HRA approval for a randomized study of whether resilience can be enhanced amongst surgeons using an accepted psychological intervention. I won't bore you too much with the details, except to say that we've, we've used and developed an existing intervention, um, and we've modified it to be used um, amongst surgeons in three two-hour one-to-one sessions. We're going to randomize people um, into an intervention group and a waitlisted control. If you are a trainee, if you're a TPD, and you would be interested in being part of this randomized study, then please, please contact me. And finally,
can we do things better when something has happened? Is there an effective first aid response? And this is so important. And in the aftermath of Bawagaba, the profession over recent months seems to finally be waking up to the importance of, of this kind of issue. When this, and I've just taken two things from the BMJ just in the last few weeks. When Liam Brennan, who's president of the Royal College of Anaesthetists, was interviewed in the back of the BMJ, and one of the questions that people are always asked is, what single change would you like to see made to the NHS? His first response is that we, are, we would be better at looking after each other. James Titcombe is a patient safety campaigner. He became one when he and his wife suffered the tragedy of their nine-day-old son uh, dying as a result of serious failures in his care at Furness General Hospital, part of the Morecambe Bay NHS Trust. And he's become an eloquent and articulate campaigner for how we, as a health service, deal with the impact of adverse events. And he was asked, what would be the most important things that we would do better when something goes wrong? And of all the things he could have said about transparency or speed of investigation or not keeping people hanging on, this is what he said was the most important. A clear commitment relating to how healthcare staff will be supported in the aftermath of an adverse event. And if that wasn't important enough across the profession, this is why it's important for us as urologists. These are quotes from consultant neurological surgeons about what happened to them when something went badly wrong. I felt and feel very guilty, but I remain disappointed by the lack of support from my employer and, and how this resonates with what we've heard this morning. I felt I was treated like a criminal first rather than any duty of care to me as an employee doing his job. It always feels callous to talk about the impact on yourself as a surgeon when you know the family have suffered so much more, but unfortunately, my trust really didn't know how to handle me or the process, and I was not well supported. And what we've heard um, as we've spoken to people about this is that actually no one has any idea what to do. The trust certainly don't. They don't know whether you should go on gardening leave, how long for, whether you can come back. Can you come back to operate or just to do clinics? Do you need someone with you? Can you only do paperwork? We know that there are immediately multiple stakeholders who need to get involved. The BMA, your protection society, maybe the college. If, colleague, college. if you're a trainee, then uh, the deanery. And all those people have something they want from you and something to offer, but no one's coordinating their response. So in the third strand of our work, what we've uh, begun to do is to assemble people who we think have something to say and something to offer and to get them around the table and to begin to develop what we've called SAFER, Surgical Adverse Event First Aid Response. We know that it won't be adequate for all situations, but I think we're confident that it will, that it will be better than, than the complete vacuum that we have at the moment. And we hope those discussions will begin later this year. We all know that as ordinary people doing an uh, unusual job, that our pay at powers can be laid to waste because of what we do. And we know that it is the gentler influences in life that make our worth, lives worth living. We owe it to each other and to ourselves to make sure that there's still a place for those gentler, gentler influences. And we owe it particularly to our patients. I'd like to acknowledge the people in Bournemouth who um, have worked with me on this work, to the organisations who've um, supported us and who have funded us, and to the surgeons who have contributed in our survey or in the things they've sent me and the things they've said. The survey is still open. I would really, really like to have more respondents. Please go to our website to complete the survey and encourage colleagues in our specialty and in others to do so. All surgeons, regardless of seniority, are invited to take part. And please, if you have an, inter an interest in what I've said, and particularly in being involved in our randomised intervention study, then email me or contact me via the website. I'd be delighted to hear from you. Thank you very much for listening. Kevin, thank you for your superb presentation. Unfortunately, we've run out of time and we need to continue, but I would urge you really to... Um, complete the survey, and I know that Kevin is going to be around for a little while if you want to come up to him and uh, share your experience and perhaps ask a few questions. Thank you. So we're shortly going to have a symposium, and 
Look forward to it. Thank you.